Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for making it all the way to the end. Um, this is my second Red Dot uh, Ruby conference. Um, probably the third time I've been back to Singapore. So I want to thank the team for th organizing this entire conference and then uh, Winston, I guess, for reaching out and inviting me back to Singapore. Um, hopefully this talk will be better than the one I did in 2012. Um, so I'm Terrence Lee, like I said, uh, I go by hon 2 on Twitter. Um, I come from Austin, Texas, uh, where we do really, really good tacos. I like to call it the taco capital of the nation. Um, if you're ever in town, and I'm also in town, uh, reach out to me and I'd be happy to take you out for tacos. Um, most people don't actually uh, hold me to this, but uh, I have actually done this for people. so. Um, is not a empty offer. Uh, I known for my blue hats. Uh, I do also have blue hat stickers. Um, so if you do want one, I'd be more than happy to give you one. Uh, eat, uh, probably at the after party um, as you head over there. Um, uh, like Nat said, I work for Heroku, um, and I'm just excited that uh, for all the stuff we've done for Ruby and the opportunity to kind of do all the stuff that we've done. Uh, so today is Friday, uh, and uh, that means that we have to do the Friday hug. So um, for people who aren't familiar because you're new to the Ruby community and you haven't heard of it, um, I believe it's a thing that Aaron Patterson started. He worked remote, and he would basically take a picture of himself hugging the camera, and then people would tweet photos back out. Uh, and I've gone around to various conferences and basically done this with the in entire crowd. And it's been, I think, just cool to have a collection of these Friday Hug photos. So if everyone would stand up, uh, I would appreciate uh, given the chance to take this photo. Uh, oh, sweet, house lights. So uh, I guess just make look like you're hugging a camera. If you know what you're doing, you probably just look at the person next to you. They probably know what they're doing. Uh, so, ready? Uh, one, two, three, happy Friday. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'll tweet a photo of that uh, when I'm done with my talk. Um, uh, I also learned recently that uh, Godfrey, who you heard from yesterday, uh, is doing this thing called Solo Selfie while wearing this awesome Han Solo shirt. Uh, so I asked him to come on stage to do yet another photo uh, where we will do, demonstrate doing a Solo Selfie so you can then do it at the after party with him while he collects all these photos. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so definitely catch Godfrey at the after party if you haven't gotten a solo selfie with him. Uh, I know he's trying to create a large collection of them. Uh, the other thing that I like to do at conferences besides Friday Hugs is uh, Ruby Karaoke. And I've been very fortunate that uh, we've been able to successfully do one for basically like the last year and a half at every Ruby conference that I've been to. Um, and so this is us doing Ruby Karaoke at RubyConf last year in the US. And if you've never done karaoke, it's totally fine, like Godfrey said. Um, but uh, in fact, most people who actually come out to these things have never done karaoke before. And so it's usually their first experience at karaoke. And I've never had someone who has complained to me that they didn't have a good time. Uh, and if you're scared about singing, I think the point of karaoke is that you aren't good at singing. And that's like half the fun of it. Um, and you also won't be pressured to sing, so you can just come and have fun and kind of just enjoy the company of your fellow Rubyists in a totally different light. Um, and this is just a picture of us doing this at Vibruco last year, and that's uh, PJ Haggerty, who goes by S. Splenik uh, on Twitter. Um, and he has been instrumental in just making this happen. Um, so shout out to him. And so. We'll be doing it at 10 p.m. tonight, uh, I guess in the middle of the after party. Um, I got approval from Winston from stealing people away. Uh, we'll be doing it at K-Box in Chinatown. It's about a 10-minute walk or so, so 
we'll be leading a crowd of people. If you want to join in, uh, feel free to come join us. Uh, and it will be probably, Winston booked a room, but I think around 38 uh, per person. Um, so come join us for karaoke. It will be a pretty good time. Uh, and uh, so this is my third conference I've actually closed. Uh, and when I first started doing it, uh, I asked Aaron, who's done a bunch of these, like, what, what are you supposed to do for these things? And he told me that you're supposed to try to actually incorporate every single talk in the conference into your actual talk, uh, which sounded like a Herculean task. So uh, what I decided to do was to try to encapsulate before my closing talk all the other talks of the conference. Um, and so I first wanted to congratulate uh, just like the local Singapore Ruby group. Like, it's pretty amazing that it's been around for 10 years. I know that's not true for lots of other Ruby communities out there. Um, and it actually makes me feel pretty old because I've also been doing Ruby for 10 years. So uh, it's pretty awesome that uh, this group has been this healthy and this strong for so long. Um, so yeah. Um, and so with the opening keynote, Matt's uh, talked about soft typing and a bunch of other things. Uh, but I was super happy to find out that uh, in the Ruby community, we can cross off naming things. Because uh, with the soft typing inference, now we don't have to name these types. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, in Jason's talk, when he talked about slaying the dragon, uh, he showed that you can actually build like a Lisp language like very quickly, which was really cool. Um, and I was pretty amazed that you can actually just use this single and for doing a tokenizer thing, like this is actually not a very long regular expression. So uh, first time I've seen something like this, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, for the Ruby golf talk uh, that Joy did, it was really neat to, I guess, learn all the ways that I should probably not write my Ruby code. But it was definitely neat to see like all the different secrets. Uh, I, de I did not know uh, numbers two to four at all. And, uh, I, d I definitely think she's right. Like number four is really neat. The fact that you can pass that regular expression in is very cool. Um, Prothematch did a great job of talking about all the changes in Rails 5 testing. I didn't realize that all these changes have actually happened. Um, but I think the conclusion for me was that I've basically been doing controller tests wrong, like the fact that we should not be doing them. Um, so I thought this meme was appropriate there. Um, Godfrey talked about uh, software education. And I think it was great to kind of, A, like kind of tackle that up front with both the boot camps and computer science. Um, and I think he really cracked the nut of it that uh, what we're trying to teach is how to think about things abstractly. Um, and abstractions are a great way to kind of form a mental model for things. Um, but of course, like any abstraction, they'll leak. And so being able to figure out how to to deal with the fact that things will eventually leak uh, as you go forward, and like how to deal with those issues uh, is an important part of, I think, that career and road path for being a good programmer in this industry. Um, next slide. Uh, I think Gr I also can't pronounce uh, Gregor's first name, but uh, uh, I, I liked his takeaway that your API is probably fast enough, and I think that is great. But apparently, this is. OK, there we go. Uh, sorry, technical problems. Um, and also enjoyed his uh, advice. Uh, he gave us a lot of great advice for how to do things with like CDNs and whatnot. Um, but I, I, I did enjoy his advice about don't be a smart ass uh, with that. Um, uh, on to the lightning talks for the first day. Uh, Joe did a great job of talking about why people are leaving uh, companies in general. I think the turnover rate in tech is astoundingly high. Uh, I think like if you make it up to like a whole year at a company, that's like you're basically really old and a veteran at that point, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, but I, for me, I learned that basically Google is filled with lies, uh, which is news because I thought everything on the internet was true, uh, and that people don't leave because of managers, which is something that I never thought of. Uh, so that was neat to learn. Uh, Shabbat Hassan talked about uh, how, to e how you can easily contribute to Ruby. Um, and I think it's nice that he highlighted in a single place that you can basically like, run the test with six simple commands. Um, and the other thing that I learned was that uh, documentation is really hard in Ruby, uh, which is nice to know because I feel like that's the common advice you get oftentimes about contributing to open source projects. Like, oh, you can just contribute documentation. Um, and like, actually understanding how all that stuff works can be difficult. Um, 
Uh, and Kita uh, talked about speeding up the test suite, uh, but I did appreciate in the beginning, she gave a bunch of advice, but uh, the fact that, man, these slides are not changing. Okay, there we go. That uh, if you have no tests, there will be no slow tests. I thought that was pretty neat. Um, uh, and then next we talked about f basically like flexible authorization. Um, having done some authorization stuff in the past, uh, this can definitely be challenging, um, but it was neat to kind of see the f like forward progress in making a better authorization system that allows, I guess, more power to the end user and not have to kind of step in and dive uh, towards those things. Um, and I also didn't know there was an open standard, so that was new for me, uh, XACML. Um, and uh, then Tim gave a talk about kind of next generation web apps. Uh, and it was neat to see how you can basically build an architecture of stuff where um, like, the ability to easily change things is kind of at the uh, core front of it, uh, the forefront of it. Um, so just having uh, like a positive architecture that provides maintainable, sustainable, and joyful development. Um, and I'm pretty sure people who have dealt with uh, legacy Rails applications uh, are aware of kind of the issues that come from dealing with older code bases. So seeing something that tackles those problems up front uh, was really neat to see. Uh, and then Sao, uh, Sao Shang t uh, had this great talk at the end of the first day where he showed us a bunch of simulations. Um, and I think I was just amazed by uh, when he actually opened the code of how simple it was. And it was neat to kind of see, like, oh, it doesn't actually take a rocket scientist to do like, kind of these crazy simulations. Um, you can actually do it inside of Ruby and uh, kind of run your own experiments. So I thought that was really neat. Um, uh, so uh, for the opening keynote today, uh, uh, Aaron uh, talked about a reference to my talk. But that's kind of weird, because I'm doing my talk now. So uh, I took a picture of him doing this so we could have a circular reference uh, at, at this conference. Um, uh, Samir's talk about scientific computing in Ruby was really awesome. Uh, I thought that uh, the iBook thing was um, just kind of just a really impressive demo that you can just do all that stuff in line. Um, but for me, uh, the thing that I learned was uh, about Daru and uh, in Hindi that it meant alcohol. Um, so I thought I would put up a thing for the Singapore slang, uh, which was what I think about for alcohol when I come to Singapore. Um, I thought Constantine did a great job of t just kind of disrupting salary stuff in general and, and kind of the uh, thought process behind how Travis reached the point where it did. Uh, and I mean, besides uh, currents, like foreign currencies being really hard, and I thought that gold example was uh, kind of crazy for the uh, per diems, uh, just like salary stuff in general is really tricky. So uh, kudos to Travis for paving a better way forward, and I'm looking forward to kind of how all that stuff works out and as they get closer to open sourcing and having those discussions. Um, Vipple uh, talked about a bunch of stuff about speeding up the front end. I learned many things that were actually happening in Rails 5. And I talked to him after, and he said, oh, yeah, that's only like kind of the tip of the iceberg of like all these changes that are actually happening. So looking forward to all the things that are coming in Rails 5. Uh, and, but uh, it's nice to know that uh, we can now cross another thing off of hard things in computer science, because uh, from all the caching stuff, I remember back in the day when Russian doll caching came out, DHH was saying they solved caching. So. Excited that we've now crossed off like two of the hard things in computer science. Um, and Sionese talked about uh, the Internet of Things. It was just like really impressive to kind of see uh, all this stuff and how approachable it is. Uh, I definitely have seen people talk and about it uh, a lot at various, well, not a lot, but I've seen a few talks about it at Ruby conferences. Um, and I think uh, the crux of it for me, the takeaway was. Uh, now that it's becoming more consumer friendly and more developers are digging into it, like how, what are we going to do with the data and like how we handle all that data is going to be really important in the future um, with both like machine learning and other things and big data. And uh, it will be neat to see how uh, we as a community kind of tackle those problems. Um, uh, Yasuko did a great job of. Um, uh, talking about upgrading Rails, um, uh, one of the things, one of the quotes for me that really stuck out was 
Uh, I think it's very easy when you talk about leggy systems to kind of throw all that stuff away. Uh, and uh, one of the things that Yehuda has told me uh, a lot while working with an open source is like, uh, it's dangerous to just throw away like that old legacy code. Uh, and I think this quote from her, from her talk, really highlights that is that like the fact that this system exists and it's solving real problems means that there's probably things that are in this code base that you may not understand, but is actually solving real problems. And you should think twice about just like starting stuff from scratch and throwing all that stuff away because there's a lot of intelligence and knowledge built into that code. Um, so onto the blog posts. Uh, I really enjoyed this Japanese quote from the blogging thing. Uh, or the proverb, I guess, uh, three years on a cold stone will make uh, the stone warm. Uh, but I mean, I, I think this applies beyond just blogging. Like perseverance and kind of dedication to something really pays off in, in order to either learn a new language uh, or you know really want like if you want to contribute to Rails, it definitely like takes a lot of effort and time. And having that motivation to keep going, I think, makes a big difference there. Uh, uh, I thought it, uh, that made the kind of whole story uh, that Jack gave of interacting with the maintainer uh, is unfortunately not a rare thing, but it was sad to see like the results of that ended up the way it did, but I'm glad that he learned many things from it. Uh, but yeah, definitely don't believe in the stars on GitHub. Uh, it can definitely reflect different things. And um, uh, I think the other key takeaway from that talk for me was that uh, PRs can be used as a conversation opener, and you shouldn't make them like kind of this absolute perfect thing. I mean, you should definitely put work in front for them, um, but definitely use it as a way to start a conversation with the contributors and maintainers of that project to then work towards a, an eventual thing that would get merged. Uh, Yuki talked about a bunch of stuff. I actually had no idea about the experimental stuff, so that's neat to see. Hopefully, we'll see that stuff soon in uh, a new release of Ruby, so I don't have to. Uh, require a specific thing for it, but he talked about a bunch of different tips. Some of them I've heard before, and, and many of them I didn't. Um, but I'm definitely most excited about the explainshell.com um, because there's definitely a lot of archaic things I think in shell that it would just be nice to have someone kind of tell me what those things are and what they're actually doing. Um, uh, Stephen did a cool job of just talking about. React and telling why people really flock to this framework and how you can kind of apply those paradigms down into Rails itself. Uh, and I think it's neat to see with both functional programming languages uh, like Elixir and uh, Phoenix, uh, framework Phoenix be on the rise uh, that uh, these kind of declarative paradigms allow you to easily reason about where problems are in your code base and like how, um, how to make sense of all those things and where you need to look, uh, which is really neat. Uh, and welcome to the Ruby communities in. Uh, it's nice to see people. Uh, I think one of the great things is just seeing people always being welcomed and joined into this ecosystem. Um, and for sure, like uh, the stuff in those code schools uh, are very far from what things are in reality. Uh, but um, I think uh, just this whole journey is pretty magical of just uh, having that feedback loop and having access to mentors and uh, being part of a larger community. Uh, so good luck on your journey there. And uh, thank you for taking the time to give that lightning talk. Uh, and uh, finally, for the Kira's talk, uh, of course, uh, regular expressions are really hard. Um, and I'm glad that um, we're pursuing stuff where, as an end user, I don't have to write very fragile code. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing how those things progress. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of what I had for all the other talks for mine. Um, uh, so let me get to, I guess, like my story and uh, I guess the crux of uh, the, the talk itself. So uh, before I get to my Ruby story, um, the first real programming language that I learned was Perl. Um, and I really enjoyed Perl at the time. Um, but then I, when I w went back and actually read my code, I found it really hard. So I think the moniker of like a write-only language uh, started to make sense to me. Um, uh, I, and this relates to kind of the Ruby golf things. Like all those shorthands and things can make things very unclear to write. But it was really cool. I think Perl's like one of those like epitome like golf kind of languages. Like the amount of stuff you can do on a single line is kind of crazy. Um, but it was great for scripting. Um, 
And then when I got into web development, like, I went towards PHP. And I think there was probably many of us uh, back in the day in Ruby who dabbled or did a lot of PHP. Um, um, but we were definitely left like fairly unhappy. And I heard about Rails, uh, which was kind of this holy grail in my mind at the time when I was young. And I was like, oh, this is like the silver bullet that's going to solve all my web development problems. Uh, so after hearing a bunch about Rails, I uh, picked up this pickaxe book uh, back in 2006 and started learning Ruby. Um, and uh, since then, I've, it, this was a language that really spoke to me. And I've been very fortunate to be able to work on uh, various different open source projects, uh, in addition to having a full-time job that paid me to actually use the Ruby language every day, which was really cool. So you know, like I got to work on Bundler for a few years, and then maintain Rescue for a short stint. Uh, um, Matt's, for some reason, gave me a commit to Ruby, and then I've uh, Help with, uh, I know Rails Girls used to have uh, a strong following in Singapore that's now changed to its own thing. But uh, I was um, help with open sourcing the, the Rails Girls guys, which was a really cool kind of just experience to see that whole community there. Um, so, you know, kind of after doing this for 10 years, like, why am I still using Ruby? Like, there's so much other stuff that's happening and so much interesting tech that is happening around us. Um, and I, I think first and foremost for a lot of us, like the Ruby community is a really special place. Uh, there's a lot of I've met so many amazing people in my journey for the last ten years uh, that are now like really close friends of mine. Uh, but even beyond that, like every conference I go to, I always meet really cool people that are doing some pretty amazing things. Um, and uh, the fact that RailsBridge and Rails Girls are both successful in the community. Uh, means that we've done at least a decent job of trying to be inclusive and trying to make it better. Um, the fact that we care about things like diversity is just really neat to see we're at the forefront of a lot of that. Uh, you know, we're not where we want to be, but like the fact that it's an open issue and like people talk about it is really great to be in that community and it's something I'm very proud of. Um, and then even beyond just like that stuff, uh, I think it's really neat that we in the community itself, like encourage people to explore other languages and go learn and, and do stuff, and not just do everything inside of Ruby itself. Uh, I know Matt says he can't uh, leave Ruby, but like I, I know he examines and does research on other languages too. And you know, for some people, they leave and they don't come back. They find greener pastures elsewhere, and for others, they do stuff and then bring stuff back and make Ruby better. Um, I think it's great to see Ruby conferences. Uh, like bake this into a thing. So like at RailsConf this year, uh, Brian Carrella gave a talk on Phoenix, uh, this Rails-like framework inside of Elixir, and the fact that there was this alternate framework track that is like sanctioned as a part of uh, RailsConf, and is just like great to see that you don't see in many other languages. Um, and one of the and one of the things that Ruby has been around for a long time is that it's not considered cool. And I think you know like. The, this blog post by uh, Jared Friedman really kind of hits that point home a little bit that like, oh, back in the inflection, I think around 2014-ish, uh, like Node.js was more popular search term and like it's climbing and skyrocketing while the popularity of Rails is kind of diving down. And uh, in his blog post, he talks about how if he was to start a new company, he would not choose Ruby or Ruby and Rails as the kind of language and framework of choice to kind of base your technology on. Um, but on the flip side of that coin is that, you know, like, we're starting to become a more mature ecosystem. I think Rails came out, and the first release of Rails was in 2005, so it's 2016, so it's over 10 years old. Um, and uh, a lot of these things have means that for web development specifically, like, we have all these efficiencies and uh, uh, being able to do, like, if you're going to build a new app in, in something like Rails, it's actually fairly quick. And I think it would be hard, you'd be hard pressed to find something that uh, you could do just as well as Ruby. I think that's something we do really well. Um, and and, and like, uh, like Matt's talking about, just like forgetting, like I don't want to worry about small things. I think there's something really unique about uh, the Ruby ecosystem and community. And like one of the values we have that I think other communities don't is that we have this uh, unique attention to detail that we care about. We care about the developer experience. Like I think the tools that we generate in our community care about error messages. Like that error messages are good. Um, that like 
you don't have to do extra steps to do things. And so uh, this is a quote that Yehuda gave me while I was talking with him uh, the other day, just like coming back to Ruby and doing some things every now and then, it feels like a fresh, a breath of fresh air. Uh, so if it isn't something you get to do all the time, it feels really nice to come back and, and use this language and the tools that are in this ecosystem. Um, but of course, there are also downsides to doing stuff in Ruby. Um, not everything is on this golden path. There are less well-traveled paths that aren't as well-developed. Um, and so I'm kind of, I'm going to go for the meat of this talk into like three different use cases that I think Ruby has maybe not done as well uh, over the years. Um, and uh, kind of explore like what we can do about that. Uh, so I think probably the biggest sticking point that most people talk about is that people think Ruby's slow. Uh, and um, at this point, uh, uh, definitely at Heroku too, like, fast is a feature. Like, people want things that are performant. Um, and I, I, I think, like, as a community, we've taken that to heart, right? Like, uh, Appfolio and Matts have gotten together and started this Ruby 3x3 initiative, which I think is really great. I'm excited to see when Ruby 3 actually lands. Um, um, and to see kind of all those performance gains. Um, but even before like Ruby 3 hits, uh, uh, I'm very happy that Heroku has sponsored uh, Matt's Koichi and Nobu for the last, I think, like five years. Uh, and um, I think be the stuff that we've seen in the ecosystem from that is that we've had uh, like regular release cycles like every Christmas now since 2.0, right? Like 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, uh, 2.4 coming out this year, uh, most likely will land on time. Um, and we've also seen uh, actual iterative improvements that we can use on a regular basis, right? So like in 2.1, we got the generation garbage collector. In 2.2, we got the incremental garbage collector. Both of those uh, Koichi worked on. Um, and in 2.3, there's a bunch of other performance improvements and kind of the start of some like ahead of time compilation stuff that Koichi is exploring. And it's neat to see that this isn't stuff that's like you have to wait when Ruby 3 lands. It's stuff that you you get to use and is free to use by just upgrading your Ruby, um, which is great. Um, so thank you to the Ruby core team. Thank you, Appfolio. Thank you, Roku, and everyone else who's contributed to kind of make this a just better runtime. And so I'm super thankful that that is stuff that is things that we don't have to do, and we just get better performance. Um, but the perception of Ruby being fast is still a thing that we have to tackle. Um, there has been, in the last uh, five years or so, a handful of companies who have started off in Ruby or had departments that started off in Ruby and have moved off. Uh, one example of this is LinkedIn. There was another one that was Groupon. And um, specifically for LinkedIn, they moved uh, from uh, Ruby, I believe, to Node. And the reason why was because of the fact that Node does such a good job, like uh, in Kira's talk, we we're talking about Le leveraging like I/O performance, so we're talking about doing like micro web services that maybe call a bunch of APIs or do a bunch of database calls, um, and you have all these micro web services that do this work. And Node from the ground up does a really good job of doing all these things. Um, so when you're building a micro web service to do that, like as a technology stack, Node makes a lot of sense. Like you have in your standard library uh, non-blocking evented I/O libraries and functions, right? Um, which is not the case in Ruby. Uh, and I am thankful that in Ruby, when I'm doing stuff, that this is not a thing that I have to do. But it does make a lot of sense when you're building these kind of apps. Um, and so I don't know how many of you are familiar with the JVM ecosystem. It sounds like some of you, because Pivotal, I know, is doing a bunch of that. Uh, but there's this uh, micro framework called Rat Pack. Um, and, uh, I think we're really fortunate to have a bunch of different VMs like JRuby out there that allows us to leverage basically the entire JVM ecosystem, but still do stuff in Ruby. And Rat Pack, um, Rat Pack is a uh, HTTP framework that is invented from the ground up. And it leverages Netty, if you're not familiar, which is um, an event-driven uh, networking engine at the low level that allows it to be highly performant. So, a lot of similar things that make like Node great, uh, and so I said reactive like, and so what what does reactive actually mean? Um, uh, so I think for most people it means the non-blocking communication, so the ability to kind of do that work like in the chat bot where 
you don't have to wait for the server or for the I/O for some call to come back while you're doing I/O and just block the whole time. Um, and I think a really good we're, real world example of that is like if you're calling customer service. So I think the standard case is like you call you call a like customer service and you get put on hold and you basically have to wait there uh, until like the next uh, customer service representative is available. Uh, and that is the example of like a blocking call. Um, but there are some customer service uh, places that actually just take your phone number and then you can get off the phone, do whatever you want, and then they eventually call you back. And so to me this is like a very close example of like what a real world uh, blocking versus non-blocking looks like. Um, and so Rat Pack gives us the ability, as we're doing any I/O in it, to have this async non-blocking communication. Um, and we're able to leverage the concurrent libraries inside the JVM to, to kind of do this and have all this non-blocking stuff from the ground up. Um, so what's nice about Rat Pack and doing it inside of JRuby is that we can write code. So this is a simple hello world that looks very similar to Sinatra. Uh, not knowing like any Rat Pack stuff, I'm sure you could read this and more or less understand what it's doing. Of course, this is very simple, but uh, the handlers block basically allows the handlers inside of Rat Pack. It, it basically defines like all the asynchronous non-blocking code that we want to do, um, and inside of that, we're just uh, setting up uh, the various routes that we're going to have. So you have a chain for get, and you can use any of the HTTP verbs, and then as a parameter to that, you just pass the path that you want to do. So very similar to how Sinatra's get and post and all those things work. Um, but where Rat Pack really starts to show a difference versus doing something in Sinatra is the fact that you can do streaming super easily. So you can do streaming and leverage the fact that this stuff is async, so you're not going to block on the stuff like you would inside of Rack um, and not have to use like Rack Mallow or something like that. And uh, so in this example, what's nice is that uh, while we're streaming, we're consuming work uh, on the server. But any time that it block, that it has to basically wait for stuff, like another another uh, route can get processed, or uh, that stream while it's waiting can work on another thing. Um, and so that allows us to achieve a lot more concurrency and, and throughput while uh, writing fairly like understandable code. Um, okay. And so to set up a simple benchmark to show what kind of performance you would get from doing this kind of stuff. Uh, I wrote a very simple uh, thing that simulated basically like doing some type of I.O. call, uh, like fetching results from a database. So in this case, uh, I'm just sleeping for 300 milliseconds, and then I'm just returning some response back. And when I compare this with uh, basically the comparable code in Node, which I'm not showing, but uh, I'm happy to show anyone uh, after the talk, uh, we see we actually get fairly comparable performance numbers. Uh, the Rat Pack stuff uh, looks better, but um, I would just go and say that you can get comparable performance writing this kind of uh, JRuby code that is fairly easy to read and understand, especially as a Rubyist, and not have to reach out to something like Node when you want to build micro web services. Uh, so to me, that's like very exciting, because this is stuff that you can use today. Uh, this isn't some like future tech that is around. Um, but you can use Rat Pack today with JRuby, write, write stuff in Ruby itself, and uh, do things that Node is really good at. And if you want to learn more, you can go to this link. There's a blog post that basically details all these slides and go, walks through kind of explaining Rat Pack more and the things you can do with it and kind of setting it up, running it, and deploying it to Heroku. Um, so that's there. I'll publish the slides and tweet it so you, can, um, you don't have to write any of that stuff down. So we talked about I.O. for a little bit. So now let's talk about like CPU bound performance. Um, so for this, you probably th like you would think of like number crunching, machine learning, any kind of intensive algorithm for that kind of stuff. Um, and I think this applies beyond just that kind of work. Like this, like what you would think is the quintessential like thing you would do for CPU bound work. And in Ruby itself, when you're doing a Rails app. Uh, uh, Sam Saffron in this pull request actually posted this graph of the kind of call, the CPU time of the call methods, and uh, at the top that he highlighted in blue, you see blank, uh, which is active support blank, and he said that it marks basically like almost four percent of the total CPU call time to process this request, 
which if you think about, like, that's actually kind of crazy. Like, blank is not a very complicated method. Uh, so this is the implementation of blank. It basically just checks if, you're, if the string is empty or you have white space characters. And if it does, it returns true, or else it returns false. Like, not a very complicated method. But the fact that it consumes almost 4% uh, of like, a requ re request is um, a lot of CPU time. So what can we do about it? Uh, I think the standard solution to any kind of CPU intensive thing is to write a native extension. So of course, that's what Sam did. Uh, and so he wrote this thing called FastBlank, and this is the code. You're not expected to read it. Um, and uh, with that, he was able to actually achieve like pretty nice improvements. right? So when you're just doing a normal uh, benchmark against it, he was able to get 20 20 times, up to 20 times performance improvement over the active support implementation of Blank. Um, and then on mac some macro, macro benchmarks, he was able to improve the performance by 5%. Five, five percent. Um, uh, which, think about, for just a, a simple micro-optimization like this, is actually a lot of performance uh, for a running Rails app. Um, but the problem with that is that writing stuff in C for, I think, a lot of people is not easy. And actually learning, like learning the language of C is not tricky. It's like becoming good enough to feel confident about the C code that you've written. Um, so as an example of that, uh, this is Nokogiri, which is a, if you're not familiar, a wrapper around libxml2. Uh, and just going through and searching for it, you see that there are issues that come up for just seg faulting and issues with using it uh, that come up. Um, so even like seasoned veterans of like libraries that basically that's all that this library does run into problems. So like doing stuff in C, I think for a lot of people is non-trivial and can be very tricky to write safe code. Um, so let me introduce you to Rust, uh, which is a systems programming language. Uh, kind of meant to tackle these kind of issues and problems. Um, and so this is a copy and paste from the, if you just go to rustlang.org uh, of what it is. But I think what makes it really neat is that it tries to tackle these safety concerns that people have um, with doing stuff in systems level programming languages. And also introduces like higher uh, level primitives that we're used to inside of Ruby, like iterators and uh, macros and things like that. Um, so for instance, um, when you actually compile a Rust program, um, the, the compiler guarantees that you won't actually run into a seg fault uh, in the future at runtime. So this is really nice because as people who are used to not dealing with small things, like this kind of stuff that you have to do with C is definitely like a lot of small concerns that you definitely don't want to deal with. Um, uh, so that level of confidence. And uh, the other nice thing, benefit of doing something in Rust is that uh, you have these, this thing called zero cost abstractions. And what I mean by that is in Ruby, every time you define a method or you refactor something into something cleaner, uh, like we saw uh, throughout this conference, um, it, there is a minor performance hit to doing a method call. You put it on the stack and you have to call it. Uh, and generally, this doesn't matter, but if you actually care uh, about the performance of that thing, like every little bit counts, right? But in Rust, you don't actually have to make this trade off because you pay that cost at compile time. The compiler is able to see these methods and kind of optimize the code in that way, um, where we're not able to do that in an interpreted language like Ruby. Um, and I was talking about higher level primitives like each and map and things like that. And uh, it goes so far that when you do something like each and map, it actually gives the compiler more information. So you, it's actually faster than writing the loop by hand with like a for loop. And because it doesn't actually have to do any of the bounds checks, which you would have to do with a for loop. Um, so it's nice that it actually encourages you to use these higher level primitives that we're used to using in Ruby. So in Ruby, like, it might be slower to actually like, do something like these fancy things. But in Rust, it's actually not. Uh, so that's what I mean by zero cost abstractions. Um, and so the implementation of uh, blank uh, versus that C code, the kind of core of it is this. So uh, not knowing any Rust at all, if you were to read this, uh, you may not know everything that it's doing. But this is actually fairly readable code. Like there's pretty high level primitives that are here where like is white space. Uh, the fact that it has this all iterator, um, so it uses uh, you know parentheses instead of curly braces. 
Um, and it is statically typed, as we see, because there's signatures and stuff there. But this, this code isn't actually that crazy uh, as a Rubyist reading it, not knowing anything about Rust. Um, uh, and so uh, Godfrey Yehud actually ran some benchmarks of this implementation of blank versus fast blank, and of course Ruby. And uh, you can see that versus the C implementation of FastBlank, we actually get fairly comparable performance, which both are significantly faster than uh, doing it in pure Ruby. Um, and uh, this, this code in yellow are the codes that I put on the slides that uh, were earlier. And all the other code, and so that, that's like kind of the unique code that kind of describes solving that problem. And uh, the gray code around it is kind of the boilerplate code that you have to write to get this Ruby gem to actually work. So as you'd see in the Rust case, it, it's kind of a fib to say, oh, like it's not actually that much code because we're writing all this other boilerplate to kind of make the Rust part work. Um, so that's not that great if we actually want to do this on a more regular basis, to have to, have to copy, paste, and do those things uh, all the time. Um, so. Let me introduce you to this other project that um, is called Helix. Uh, they work on this project called Helix, which is kind of named after this bridge in Singapore. So I went out uh, actually on Wednesday night to take this photo so I could put this in the slide. Um, and so this is a picture, if you don't know, of Yehuda and Godfrey who are actually working on this project. Um, and what Helix is, it, is it's this bridge between uh, Rust and Ruby that allows you to kind of remove all that boilerplate code, all that stuff in gray. Um, so you can just focus on solving the problem that you want to do in Rust. And so you can actually define like Ruby classes inside of Rust that do the work that you want to do. So uh, if you, all that stuff can be replaced by this simple slide here. And this is all the code that you have to write in Rust to make that happen. Um, so it's significantly smaller than that code from uh, a few slides ago. Um, and what, what makes this really exciting is kind of having something like Helix uh, unlocks a lot of different opportunities. Uh, I think if the cognitive load of actually writing a C extension is significantly lower, you can start talking about doing it for other things beyond FastBlank, right? Like even for a specific app that is not like a general Rails thing, you could start profiling your app uh, like Gregor talked about. And uh, if there are things that are called a lot or take a lot of CPU call time, you can actually re-implement those things using Helix inside of Rust to get the performance you need and uh, massively improve the performance of your application. Uh, there's also talk of like inside of active support, like stable APIs that would make sense to re-implement in Rust to kind of get performance and kind of extrapolate those kind of things out. Um, I think there's a really exciting future where we can do more things like FastBlank. Um, and where all you have to do is basically include some type of gem, like turbo blank or turbo whatever, and actually just get that performance for free because we're running uh, inside of a native extension. Uh, and if you want to learn more about that, uh, Godfrey did a talk at RailsConf, which is on uh, confreaks.tv, if you look, up for, look it up uh, under RailsConf 2016. Or you can actually go to this blog post where he kind of deserialized that talk into a blog post. Uh, that kind of describes all this stuff in more detail. Um, and the last kind of big problem that I want to talk about is packaging in Ruby. Um, and you know, like in Java, you have stuff like wars and stuff. But in Ruby, you kind of have to you know, deploy all this source code and then bundle install and do all this stuff just to deploy your app. Um, and uh, to kind of illustrate this story, I want to talk about the Heroku tool belt. And if you aren't familiar with it, it's the CLI command line that you use to kind of to interact with Heroku. Uh, instead of using the dashboard, uh, you can do stuff on the command line. And it has a long history. Heroku's been around for, I don't know, like nine years or something at this point. Uh, and we, when we first started uh, trying to build something like this, we started with a Ruby gem. Uh, so you would gem install Heroku. And you can still do this today, though I don't think it's kept up to date. Uh, and this was kind of a decision at the time because Heroku started as a Ruby company for Ruby developers. And it made a lot of sense to build something that was native for Rubyists to use. So you would just gem install Heroku, and then you, know, you create a Heroku account, you log in, you're kind of off to the races. Um, but it had its own set of problems. Uh, as we uh, became polyglot um, and started supporting other stacks 
uh, and languages, uh, it was an issue because as a Python person, in order to use Heroku, I had to now install Ruby just to gem install Heroku to then use this product where I had no interest potentially in Ruby at all. Um, so that was an issue for us. Uh, and uh, beyond that, um, even for Rubyists, like it became a support issue because people could have diff totally different versions of Ruby. Uh, and then this was uh, even before like RBM was a thing. So most people were using like system level Rubies. So like if app you were running a different version of OS X, you potentially got a newer version of Ruby. Uh, so then we had to make stuff always compatible with Ruby 187 because that was the oldest version of Ruby that Apple kept keeping around for a long time. So uh, we could never use any of the nice like syntax and things that came out in Ruby 1.9. Um, so then to solve that problem, we decided to uh, package the Ruby runtime inside of like a tarball itself and distribute that um, in and of itself. And that was really great because it solved that like what Ruby runtime are we using, what are we supporting. Uh, but then it kind of turned all this work of actually packaging into our hands. So then we had to have like actually a separate Windows box that sat under someone's desk with like, you know, like Windows licenses and things and and build that Ruby binary with the package and distribute that. We had to do the same thing for OS X and then when Apple decided to add like all the signing stuff, like it broke like that whole tool chain, we had to go fix that. Um, and then same thing for Linux, we had to do special things for Linux and then you run into all the distribution problems with uh, Linux being fragmented too. And so as you imagine, this is like not a great experience and it made it hard to actually like package and release new versions of the tool belt. Whereas before, like publishing and doing stuff inside of Ruby gems is actually easy. You just like publish the gem, you just run a single rake task and you're up and running. Um, and since then there has been uh, a project and so now the current tool belt is a mix of like Go, JavaScript and uh, Ruby, though the Ruby code's being removed. Uh, and at the start of that was this project called HK that a Heroku employee uh, worked on. And the main, there was two really big motivating factors for that. One of them was that, uh, like I was saying, fast is a feature. And so the speed of the HK binary was simply faster than doing stuff inside of Ruby. Um, so if you just look at this top benchmark here, running Heroku version on the Ruby CLI at that point took over a second. And then the Go version, mainly it did less things, was like 16 milliseconds. So if you want something that's like highly interactive, you can imagine that that kind of sucks to have to wait a second every time you're trying to do something with uh, your product. Um, and part of the crux of that is that like requiring Ruby is not very fast. So like as we modularized the code base, because we didn't want to have like one single file that was huge that had all the commands and things, we broke stuff out. Um, uh, like you have to actually pay that cost every time at boot up. And so then we did a bunch of work to kind of minimize all that stuff. Uh, so we don't require the files that we actually needed. Um, and then the second part of that was Go was able to basically create these statically compiled binaries that were portable. Um, so we could compile specific ones for each of the different language versions uh, that we needed. Um, so that made a lot of sense. And um, even beyond the Heroku case, there are examples of like inside of HashiCorp, they've done a bunch of stuff in Ruby. They had Ruby CLIs. Uh, and I think Vagrant is still a Ruby CLI, but all their new projects now are written in Go for CLIs because of just the benefits that I listed. Like it just makes a lot of sense when you're distributing this to actual customers. Um, and I kind of found at the end of the day that there aren't any real great packaging stories. Like there's traveling in Ruby, there's other things out there, but all these things are kind of this manual process where you have to trust on them to build these packages for you. And, and if you kind of stray off that golden path, you're kind of out of luck. So uh, I started a project called MRuby CLI that was really focused on trying to tackle this problem. Um, and at the crux of it is this project called MRuby that Matt started, which is a yet another Ruby VM. Um, and it's an embeddable Ruby that is meant to be embedded in other languages, which uh, provide a lot of benefits, but also had various trade-offs. So it's a lighter weight Ruby, it uses less memory, but also foregoes like all the IO and kind of other things that are associated with uh, platforms. So a lot of things that you're used to inside of standard lib don't exist. Uh, and the fact that it also doesn't have a standard lib. Um, and we had a bunch of design goals when working on this project. The first one being, I want to be able to write stuff in Ruby. I don't want to write like a CLI in Go or uh, C or something else. Um, and so inside of MRuby, uh, MRuby CLI, 
uh, MRuby uses this MRuby lib directory, and we generate all these files, and you can actually just write this Ruby code, and you just write straight up MRuby. And it looks very much, it pretty much is like regular Ruby code minus a few differences. Um, uh, fast is a feature, I know I've said that a bunch of times in this talk, but it's true. And specifically what I mean for this case is the boot up time, right? Like, how fast can I get to actually executing Ruby code? And um, in this case, an MRI, here's the typical, like, hello world MRI use case. Uh, and uh, this is a few versions old, so I think this is like Ruby 2.2. It takes like 41 milliseconds just to print out hello world to the screen. Uh, and then when I was able to do this in MRuby CLI, we can get, get it down to three milliseconds, which uh, is a significant uh, speed improvement and fast enough where it doesn't make a difference. Uh, like, you don't have to get it that much faster to make that experience good. Um, and how we do that is inside of MRuby, there's no require. So all the stuff is loaded up front at, uh, in memory. So you're not paying that cost of searching the disk because it's compiled into the binary. Um, and then we also want to have, like in Go, this portable solution that generates a single binary for every platform. So uh, with Emory CLI, when you run the compile command, you get a 32-bit and a 64-bit binary for both for Linux, OS X, and Windows. Uh, so you can package that up and distribute that to its customers, to your customers. Uh, and then we also want a file size that wasn't massive, because we're packaging the entire uh, Emruby interpreter, and it's meant to be small. Um, so the OSX version of Emruby CLI is under a meg. It's like 421K. Um, and then for people to actually use this, like, it has to be pretty simple. So uh, to set up all these cross-compilers to actually build these binaries, you don't want to have to do all that stuff by hand. Like, in order to get started, I have to download all these various versions of GCC, you have to download MinGW, you have to download all these things to get started. Uh, so we actually set up a Docker container uh, that has all this stuff set up for you uh, that will cross-compile from Linux to Linux itself, Linux to Mac, and Linux to Windows, and, and kind of tackles uh, all that setup work that you have to do up front to get a working system. Uh, so using this thing, uh, here's what a Hello World example for just running through the workflow is. You download MRuby CLI from the MRuby CLI project. It's just a binary. You can put it anywhere on your path and just run it. Um, with the setup command, it's like Rails new, and it generates a bunch of files. Um, you go into that directory. You run the compile command with Docker. And then uh, you're able to just execute the command, and then you see hello world. Um, so that's all it takes to really get started there. And uh, here are all the files that we generate. Um, I think Rails does a good job of like making sure we don't have to bike shed on stuff, so we want to provide a similar experience there, uh, so you don't have to set up any of these things by hand. Um, and then all you really have to do is you have to edit this file, uh, and this is really the hook into how you run stuff inside of uh, MRuby CLI. So there's this underscore, underscore, main, underscore, underscore, that you can just write whatever code, and then any class or whatever that you put inside of MRV lib will become available that you can call. And then the argv uh, is just like the standard array of arguments that are passed in. Um, and so you can learn more uh, at mrubycli.org. Uh, and um, uh, after I gave a talk about mrubycli, Steve gave this, talked about this tweet about kind of just like, it's great to learn other languages. I don't think you should stop exploring and learning those things. Um, but it's also good to recognize like what Ruby isn't good at. And if we want to continue doing stuff in Ruby, we kind of have to look at these weaknesses and, and look at actual solutions, because people are running into these every day uh, in the real world, uh, are causing people to leave. Um, and I've been doing this for 10 years at this point, uh, Ruby specifically. And I'm definitely super excited about the future of Ruby. And I've never been any more excited about kind of where things are going, uh, both uh, all the things I've seen with Ruby 3, uh, the Ruby 3 by 3 project, uh, the projects that I've talked about in this talk, like being able to work on things that solve the IO bound problem, uh, the fact that, I mean, Helix isn't totally there yet, but like a future where uh, being able to write native extensions that improve the performance of my running Ruby app, and the fact that we can start looking at packaging things and making that a better story uh, is really neat. Um, and uh, even uh, this year, uh, there is this index that kind of measures the ratings of like engineers and kind of searches for the language itself. Uh, Ruby went from 16 all the way to 8 last month, which was really cool to see it like spike up again. And so it's the highest it's been since kind of the peak Rails hype. Um, so that's also exciting that 
there's kind of this resurgence of stuff in Ruby itself. And uh, I implore you to keep writing stuff in Ruby and um, without the fear that you're going to hit some wall. Because it really sucks to pick a technology be and then be forced to move away from it because of some technical limitation. I think we're getting to a point where there's going to be a future where that won't be true anymore. So uh, thank you, Red Dot. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. And uh, thanks for having me. So we don't have time for questions. Uh, thanks, Terrence, for your wonderful talk. Um, it's been a while since I practiced some Ruby, and I think I'm getting a bit rusty. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, we have, uh, I, I think, I believe we have quest uh, time for questions for Terrence. I see people moving to the mic. Awesome. Yes. I have two. First question: When you were doing the example of the blank method in uh, Ruby, C, and Rust, um, it just kind of like slammed into my head, why aren't we testing for a blank string first, return true if the string is blank, and then create the regular, regular expression or whatever only if we need to? I don't have, I feel like Godfrey could probably tell you a better answer. I don't know if you want to come up and so answer I, that. I, I, I guess it's slower. So Rail, Rails 5 actually, the, the example on the slide was actually, um, was actually the Rails 4 implementation for simplicity, I believe. Um, I, I believe as of this very moment, um, the version on Rails 5 on master actually has the empty check in front. Um, there are some ongoing. No, it does not, okay. according to them. Okay, so there, there are basically people tried different things, and then like the current version is um, more fast in the in a general case. Like if you, you can get different things out of your fast and very long string, very short string, um, padded strings and stuff like that, right? And uh, I think it's hard, the, the takeaway is it's hard to do it um, generally for a lot of cases with, um, with those kind of micro-optimizations. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And my next question is, will Rust work on JRuby? Uh, this was something I was actually talking to Godfrey about. Uh, I don't I think there's a way we can get it to work with JNI and, uh, and Helix uh, and making that code work, um, but probably out of the box, uh, not yet. Uh, and if we were to do any of this stuff inside of uh, Rails, like you, we would probably maintain both the, I was talking to Matthew Draper about this actually, at the speaker's dinner last night. We, we would probably maintain both the Ruby version to fall back to if your platform didn't support it. Uh, and then we would have the Rust thing to uh, for the cases where we could get that. Um, and I think JRuby specifically is significantly less affected by this problem than MRI because of the VM itself and also uh, when you're writing stuff in the, like if you wrote a native extension inside of Java, you're probably able to achieve, uh, you, uh, the performance delta would be significantly smaller than it would be in MRI. Thank you. Hi. Um, writing the extension in Rust is great. Uh, a lot of us don't really know C, but um, I tried le re learning Rust, and um, I ran into a lot of uh, harm speed, bu speed bumps with uh, the borrow checker. So, do you have any tips for people like that? Uh, for basically fighting the borrow checker? Yes. Um, I definitely have had to read the doc the in Rustling basically the borrows documentation a bunch of times. Uh, I think that's just a thing that will be a thing for a long time for anyone who's learning Rust. Uh, but I think that's also kind of a huge benefit of Rust, the fact that there is the borrow checker. Because the whole point of the borrow checker is that uh, the, they didn't let you compile that code because you're doing something that's unsafe. Um, and so that's just a thing that you know, like over time you'll have to learn. Uh, I don't have any great tips. Uh, I also run to, I still fight the borrow checker all the time uh, today as well. Um, but I just recognize that's me doing something dumb. Uh, that uh, the compiler is telling me I shouldn't be doing. Um, and in C, I probably would be able to just compile this code. And then I would find out later in production at runtime that I did something dumb, right? Any more questions? OK, uh, 
seems like uh, there's no more. Thank you, Terence again.